Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for your uh, your attendance and your your attention. The subject for consideration today, as you can see on the screen, is evidence for Bible belief, indisputable proofs. Now, I appreciate it as well as it being a bit of a mouthful uh, of a title. It's also um, quite a challenge um, and quite a high bar to set, indisputable proofs. And it's perhaps something that uh, for those of you that have recently picked up a Bible and started reading it, or those perhaps it's your first time, um, to, to it's not something you've perhaps heard of um, and, and, and language used when thinking about the Bible. Uh, certainly my opinion of, of the General Society's reading of Scripture, the Bible, and belief in it is that there's perhaps... Uh, a vague sort of cloud of doubt that hangs over the Bible and, and a belief in it, and that using words like indisputable proof and, and phrases like that uh, might seem a bit unusual. But but I, but I believe, and I will show you in the time we have together today, that we can say with certainty that there are indis in, indisputable proofs um, when looking at what the Bible says. I'm obviously not going to have time to consider the entirety of Scripture uh, in the short time we have together, but uh, we're going to be looking at three areas um, by way of of um, of discussion. So, what is a proof? Because what I want to be really clear about from the offset is that it, it's no good uh, as a as a speaker, as a presenter, or you as an audience listening to this, um, being told about proofs that are a bit vague. Um, reasons to not just read the Bible, but to devote your life to following it that, that aren't indisputable. Uh, reasons that are given to you that you can actually dispel quite easily. So I've just put very quickly as a way of introduction there, what, what do we mean when we say what I'm going to share with you is proof of, of, the, of a Bible belief? Uh, well, a proof, as you can imagine, is evidence or an argument establishing a fact or the truth of a statement. So these are things that I'm going to show you that I believe, and I hope you will too, that they cannot be explained away. The, these things that we're going to, 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 to discover and look at in scripture. That what we want to do is establish the truth of a belief and a confidence in the Holy Bible by showing evidence that cannot be denied. Now, whether you uh, have, have, have been a Christelphian for most of your adult life, or as I say, whether you're um, just new to the truth or even new to opening a Bible, um, it's important that we establish that these things are true and, and factual. And even if you um, are already um, ready to believe that the Bible is inspired by God, these things can still be of use to you, what we what we uh, discover and what we share together today, um, as, as things that you can share with perhaps colleagues or neighbours, uh, people you get into conversation with about the validity of the Bible and the inspiration of the Bible and why others um, need to spend time reading it um, and hopefully uh, come into an understanding through and, and baptism through uh, through what is contained in it. So the three subject areas, bits of evidence, if you like, I want to bring to your attention in our time together today uh, are there on the screen. So firstly, we're going to look at the planet. And don't worry, uh, we're not going to go into any sort of great detail and depth. But what I hope to share with you are some really logical and clear reasons why what the Bible says about the planets, and particularly the Earth, give us confidence that the Bible is true. And everything that's, that, that's recorded in the Bible is God-given. So number one, we're going to look at the planets and the Earth. Uh, the second item of evidence is Egypt. We're going to look at the nation, the empire of Egypt, and how it was destroyed and made weaker, and how those things were spoken about in Scripture years before they actually came to pass. And then thirdly, we're going to look at earthquakes and fault lines. So hopefully you'll find what we, what we consider in our time together uh, useful and interesting uh, in your study of scripture. So let's start then by looking at this first uh, subject, this first piece of evidence, if you like, the planet. And what I want to do um, for the first part of this, this first item of evidence is to consider the earth itself. Okay, and on the left-hand side there in this column, we've got three um, aspects of the earth that we are um, shown in scripture that I think we can start to look at and say, you know, scripture is telling us something that is absolutely scientifically true 
even though at the same time of when it was written, others in the world were saying other things that were different. So we're going to look at the shape of the Earth, the standing of the Earth, how it is situated in space, and then the age of the Earth. So if you open your Bibles, please, at Isaiah in chapter 40. Let's begin there with the first point, the shape of the Earth. Now, throughout history, man, uh, and I don't just mean common man, I mean great thinkers um, and, and men that looked at the cosmos and, and, and considered these things all their lives have thought many different things about the shape of the earth. Um, throughout history, some have said that the earth is flat, uh, it's a disc, um, or it is cylindrical, like a tube. Um, others have said that it is uh, like a pear or egg shaped, and some have said it is oval. Okay, and, and again, they aren't just uh, random people. These are scientists of their age throughout history who have considered these things and devoted time to them and come up with these very serious um, propositions of the shape of the earth. Okay, but if we read in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 22, the Bible also gives us uh, its, its view of the shape of the earth. Isaiah 40, verse 22. If we go in at verse 21 for some context, it's talking here about the, the creative work of God and his power. It says there, verse 21 of Isaiah 40, Have you not known? Have you not heard? Have they not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he, it is God, that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain, and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. And then at the beginning of the verse, it talks about the earth um, in God's view as a circle, and it gives it this idea of a, of a spherical shape, a sphere. And bear in mind that when Isaiah is writing, a man, a real man that lived many years ago, he, he was saying that the earth is a circle, is a sphere, even though contemporaries of his at the time were coming up with all these other ideas. That it was it was flat or it was uh, it was cylindrical. Isaiah said, "It's not. It's a sphere. It's a circle, and God sits above it all." So he had an idea that uh, sat alongside all his contemporaries. But as we have seen, as time has progressed and science has improved, that we now have photographs taken from outer space that show the Earth as a sphere. Of course, we can do, or perhaps not ourselves, but calculations can be done that show too mathematically the Earth is a sphere. It is a, it's a guaranteed fact today that the Earth is a sphere. And the Bible said that in simplicity all those years ago. And bear in mind, you can see on the right there, this idea that the, that the Earth is round, is spherical, uh, as Isaiah said, um, he said around 700 BC. Now, a name that we might be uh, familiar with Pythagoras, he only started saying that the earth could be spherical much later in 570 BC. Okay, so the Bible was well ahead of its time. This this man Isaiah wrote these words that were absolutely and you know, have since been proved to be accurate. Yet everybody else in his age were having other ideas. How how can that be? How can a man that had never been into space uh, didn't know, uh, you know, didn't have any scientific qualifications, say something that it took hundreds of years, thousands of years later to be proved to be true. Well, let's start building on this idea and hopefully we'll come to a realisation that there's only one way that could have happened, that it is God has been guiding the pen of, of this man, Isaiah, but also of all the scriptural writers. Let's move on to the second point, then the standing of the earth. How is the earth situated in space? Well, uh, you can understand what we're going to do now. Consider again what man suggested, uh, and the ideas of men have been have been very varied and, 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 and imaginative. The fact that the earth floated around in this great cosmic lake on water, um, that the earth was born on the back of, of four elephants that stood on a turtle that swam through space. That was a genuine... Um, understanding of how the earth was held in its place. Um, and then obviously the Greeks suggested that, that, that the earth was held up by this great man, Atlas, 
and supported the globe on his shoulder. And what's interesting about all those points is that they show, don't they, the, the bounded understanding of man. That in every case, they said the earth must float or sit on something. It's a huge piece of rock, weighs immeasurable amount. It either floats on water, it, it stands on, on elephants or on the, at the shoulders of a man. And yet if we turn to Job, please, verse uh, chapter 26, we can see that the Bible was saying something entirely different at that time. Job 26 and verse 7. And, and bear in mind again how ridiculous what Job was saying must have seemed to those that heard it. Job 26, verse 7, again, talking about the creative works of God, says, He, God, stretches out the north over the empty place and hangeth the earth upon nothing. Can you imagine reading those words or hearing those words, perhaps, if you were one of Job's friends, and saying, Job, how can the earth hang upon nothing? impossible it must must sit on something or float on something surely everything we recognize rests on something that's not what scripture says and again just like the shape of the earth we've come to realize and know as a fact that what job Wright wrote there that it hangs upon nothing the earth hangs upon nothing is absolutely scientifically true I'm sure we've all seen that photograph taken from the Apollo missions when they took a photograph back through space of the Earth. And we have this, this blue globe sitting in the inky blackness of space. And we would say, yes, exactly. We see what the Bible describes, the Earth hanging on nothing. So there we see, again, um, uh, one of perhaps the oldest books recorded and written in the Bible, Job, making a, a comment about how the earth was suspended in space that has taken thousands of years to be seen and proved true. How can that be? Logically, how can that be? If it not, would it be for some other uh, authority that has moved the hand of Job to write those words and to say those words? Um, and that authority, we as Christophians believe, and as Bible believers believe, is, of course, our Heavenly Father. The third item on this table here is slightly different, because I've been honest, and I've said we cannot categorically say how old the earth is and, and um, everything that dwells on it. So I've left that in red. We can, we can tick the other two things as being absolutely accurate as to what the Bible has said. But my point with this uh, idea, this element, the age of the earth, is just to highlight to you the inability for man to specifically say how old the earth is from a scientific perspective. And not only be unable to say it, but when they have given an idea, their, their willingness to update it quite radically. So if we look through there, we can say that originally in, in 1790, those that were uh, qualified or thought themselves qualified said that the earth must be 96 million years old and that was understood and agreed and accepted for for a time and then it was updated in 1862 between 20 and 400 million years that, that's quite a, a range of, of error isn't it there later on in the 1900s 1907 uh, 92 to 570 million years old and i can only suggest to you that, that man clearly doesn't have an idea, but is unwilling to say that. 1908, 56 million. 1911, 1 1.6 to 3 billion. And then 2016, which is the sort of current idea uh, in scientific circles of how old the Earth and everything on it is, is uh, 4.5 um, billion years old. And you can just see how those estimates have grown, haven't they? From 56 million uh, in, in, in 1908 through to four and a half billion years old. And again, I'm not going to stand here and say the earth is exactly this many years old. We don't know. Scripture doesn't tell us categorically. But certainly we, we've got to recognize that man has no knowledge of that either. So let's move on now to consider the, the wider view of um, of space, of the planet, and of our solar system. Where did the world come from? What a question. 
Well, the Bible gives us an answer. It says, how did it come about? It says in, in, in Isaiah, speaking about um, God again creating, I have made the earth and created man upon it. I, even my hands, have stretched out the heavens and all their hosts have I commanded. God, God says without any doubt, don't, don't look anywhere else. I am the creator. That's what God says. I've created the earth and everything on it and everything around it. It is my handiwork. And as a Bible believer, that is what I agree with because it, uh, it's said in the Bible and I believe the Bible to be true. But that isn't what everybody says. Bible critics say something fundamentally different. They say that there is no creator, there is no great master plan or design, but that it's all by chance. That it uh, came into being by the rapid expansion of matter from a state of extremely high density and temperature, which according to current cosmological theories mark the origin of the universe. That's fundamentally different, isn't it? One, Bible believers are saying it is God created. He is the designer. And the other is saying there is no designer. There is no grand plan or purpose. We are here by chance alone. Now, we would commonly know that idea of a chance a birth and a genesis, if you like, of the universe as the Big Bang. And indeed, as I'm sure we're all aware, the Big Bang is taught in schools daily as the most probable cause and, 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 and source of everything that we see in our lives. But make no doubt about it, there are some serious problems with accepting the Big Bang theory. There's four of them that I want to share with you just briefly on the screen. And again, we're not going to go into any detail. And these are things that we can logically see don't allow us to say that the Big Bang is true. Four things we're going to consider are the conservation of angular momentum, the recession of the moon, the effect of energy, and the conservation of energy. Now, these are all facts. These are, or three of them, are scientific laws that scientists use all over the world every day to predict experiments, the outcome of experiments, and, and consider as the foundation of science. Yet we have problems if we try and make the Big Bang work as the start of everything. Firstly, then the conservation of angular momentum. So the law of conservation of angular momentum states that when we have an object that's spinning and elements, fragments break off from that initial uh, mass, that they will continue to spin in the same direction that that original mass did. And if you've got really good eyesight, you can see that if fragments break off those secondary pieces, they will also continue to spin in the same direction, the conservation of angular momentum. OK, so if uh, the bit in the middle, as you can see, hopefully in the yellow there, is spinning clockwise, all the, the four balls that have spun off that spin clockwise, and all the smaller bits that are flying off those also spin, in this example, in a clockwise motion. Sounds logical. It's been proved true time and time again. Yet that's not what we see in the solar system. OK, if there was one single source, the Big Bang that exploded, this, this high density and high temperature mass exploded, then its rotation would impact the rotation of all those fragments, those, those galaxies, those stars, those planets, those moons flying off. it. They would spin in all the same direction. We would have a unity of direction throughout the universe. And we don't. So our universe doesn't follow this law of angular momentum saying that there is one source for everything. What we see in the stars tells us there isn't a singular source. Indeed, there are entire galaxies spinning backwards, as it were. In our own solar system, Uranus, Venus and possibly Pluto are also spinning backwards in a different way than the rest of the planets. Eight of the known 91 moons in our solar system are spinning in a different way. So how can that be when our own uh, scientific laws don't agree with this theory of the Big Bang, of this one central explosion that created everything we see? The second uh, the thing I want to share with you in this um, topic is the recession of the moon. Now, don't be alarmed. 
but the moon is is moving away from Earth every time it orbits. Okay, now it's not any amount at all. It's about roughly about an inch and a half every time the moon makes an orbit or an orbit around the Earth. It, its orbit becomes an inch and a half further away from the Earth. Okay, now as you can imagine, over time, those inch and a halfs um, grow together every year, every every orbit that passes. Uh, and so the longer you leave it, the further the moon becomes away from the Earth. So if you like, the moon is an easy way for us to say, well, how long has everything been in motion? Because we can uh, think about how far it's moved um, as, it, as it recedes away from the Earth. Well, now, if we were to say um, the Earth and the moon have been spinning as they are, and the moon has been uh, moving away from the Earth an inch and a half for 6,000 years or so, well, it'll have covered over those 6,000 years, moving an inch and a half every rotation, about 800 yards. Sorry, 800 feet. 800 feet. So that isn't a massive amount in, in sort of cosmic measurements, okay? 800 feet. But if we start talking about millions of years and even billions of years, the movement and, and the amount of uh, the, the, the moon has moved away from the Earth gets substantially larger. And as I said, if, if you if you imagine we we sort of rewind the clock and we go backwards and we say, well, actually, let's go back into history and the, the moon moves an inch and a half uh, every orbit closer to the Earth. How close would it be to the Earth after 4.5 billion years? Well, it would hit the Earth after one and a half billion years. OK, so it can't have been spinning around the Earth, the moon, uh, creating our tides and our seasons for four and a half billion years, as evolutionists and Big Bang supporters would have us believe. Because that regular movement uh, would put it a lot closer to the Earth and, and on the Earth if it was billions of years older. The third point here, then. The second law of thermodynamics, the effect of energy. And unfortunately, we on our, our television screens and our, our device, our tablets, we're seeing the effect of energy, aren't we, M more than we'd like to recently in the battlefields in Ukraine and in Gaza. But when there's a, a huge release of energy, an explosion, that matter is, is blown away in every direction, isn't it? The effect of energy we see visibly on the buildings, the cars, the ground, any craters that are made, we see those. That's the release of energy, the effect of energy. But the point here with this second law of thermodynamics is that when you have a release of energy, it always brings about chaos. It never brings about an ordered consequence. And uh, the two simple uh, uh, pictures there on the screen hopefully give you an idea of that. The bottom one more so. But if we were to, to stand with a, a pile of bricks and throw these bricks randomly, they wouldn't just stack up neatly, would they, all making a nice cube with straight sides and, and square corners? But there would be, just as we've seen in our, in our news uh, reels recently, there would be a mess, wouldn't they, piled everywhere. Indeed, when we think just over three years ago now, there was that explosion in Beirut where there was all the ammonium that was, was stored near the port that was that we don't know how it uh, exploded. The, the, the shockwaves reverberated throughout the city and there was this blast radius and there were cars piled up busy, and, and, and buildings knocked over, tangled bits of steel reinforcement. That is the effect of an explosion. So you imagine what the explosion, the biggest explosion, as Big Bang theorists would have us believe, that took place in our history, the Big Bang, what that would look like. Would that bring about an ordered, designed, uh, natural world that we see and is so evident in our day to day? Or more likely, would it bring about utter chaos? You see, uh, brothers and sisters and, and friends, the science that we hold dear to today, these scientific laws, the foundation of what science uses today, contradict what the Big Bang would have us believe. And finally, the first law of thermodynamics, the conservation of energy, this idea that energy cannot be created or destroyed, it can only be changed in its state, that everything over time balances out. 
Uh, we can think perhaps of a, a, a log that we put on our fire. That log disappears, but the energy that was in it has been transformed to something else, hasn't it? Hopefully heat, maybe some noise and a bit of light. Energy cannot be destroyed. So the first question any of us should ask to someone that says "Big Bang," the Big Bang is, is how the world began. So where did that energy come from? Our own thermodynamic laws say that, that energy cannot be created. And so this idea of an eternal power source, God, answers actually our scientific laws. That he has always been that source of energy. Uh, and, and about him, the natural world revolves. So we move now on to our second of three um, items of evidence for uh, indisputable proof of a belief in the Bible. The second one we're going to look at, and it's just this one slide, is how the nation, the, the empire of Egypt, swelled to be this incredibly advanced civilization and then quite abruptly was abased, was, was brought down low. So just some um, points there to remind us, if we don't know, at the top of the screen, about um, how advanced Egypt was. So Egypt was in its height between 1500 and 332 BC, roughly. And as I'm sure we're all vaguely familiar with, at least, is it was an incredibly uh, advanced civilization. They had agricultural practices and, and planning and seasons so that they were able to build up storehouses and a surplus of food. And, and with that surplus, they were able to multiply their uh, population. They had great armies and, um, and, and able to invest in, in arts and architecture. They exploited minerals and quarrying nearby. We're all familiar with the hieroglyphs, aren't we, in their, their incredibly complex writing system. Their grand construction projects are world-renowned, aren't they? The Sphinx and the, the, uh, the pyramids. They had an advanced military. They, they were one of the first civilizations to pull together a, a class of government that would control and rule over the land so that long-term decisions could be made as a civilization that would benefit their children. They forged ahead with mathematics, with, with glass technology, and with art and architecture, they were to any passerby a civilization that would last forever. That there was no empire that seemed to be able to challenge them, no skirmishes that could overtake them. And yet they're not here with us today in that state of advancement. Why is that? Well, in 580 BC, a prophet, just like we read of a moment ago in Isaiah, uh, a prophet Ezekiel made a prophecy. Uh, you don't need to turn it up, it's on the screen there. Ezekiel chapter 29, starting at verse 9, it says, And the land, this is Ezekiel, the man, the real man speaking, said, And the land of Egypt shall be desolate and waste, and they shall know that I am the Lord, because he hath said, Egypt hath said, The river is mine, and I have made it. And I'll make the land of Egypt desolate in the midst of the countries that are desolate. And her cities among the cities that are laid waste shall be desolate 40 years. And I will scatter the Egyptians among the nations and will disperse them through the countries. And I will bring again the captivity of Egypt and will cause them to return into the land of Pathros, into the land of their habitation, and they shall be there a base kingdom. It shall be the basest of kingdoms, neither shall it exalt itself any more above the nations. Well, has that prophecy, have those words that Ezekiel wrote come to pass? Because let's face it, if they haven't, then I'll be the first to close up my Bible and say, we can't trust the Bible. It says something that doesn't come about. Why would I spend any more time looking at it? But the truth of the matter is that that is exactly what happened to this seemingly indestructible civilization. In 332 BC, Egypt was conquered by Alexander the Great. This, this mighty civilization and empire that stretched across current day, modern day countries was brought low. And when Alexander the Great um, rushed in with his armies, he found actually very little resistance. And then much later on, uh, around 30 BC, Rome then overtook uh, Greece 
and the area became part of the bigger Roman province. And so the question we should ask ourselves is, how could Ezekiel write something and say something that was so accurate way before it came to pass? It might be different if he was saying it about a nation that looked like they were flagging a little bit or, or made some serious poor decisions and, and, and they were being overcome by their enemies. But when, when Ezekiel prophesied this, Egypt was strong, the strongest it had ever been. And yet he makes the most unlikely uh, prophecy that they will be abased. And so I put to you that we can uh, look at this prophecy of Ezekiel and again be certain that the Bible has not been written by men acting alone, by making rash and, and, and random pronouncements. The things we're considering all are building a picture that the Bible speaks the truth, often way before the event happens or way outside the understanding and comprehension of those that write it. And so I put to you, how can that be the case if it are not for some outside power a knowledge that exceeds the understanding of mankind, God, an eternal being, moving the hands of these writers. And finally, for our thoughts today, I want to end by thinking about earthquakes and fault lines. If you turn, please, in your Bible to Ezekiel and uh, chapter 14. And, and I put to you, brothers and sisters and friends and young people, that here we have in the 14th chapter of Ezekiel, what I think is one of the most, if not the most, indisputable proofs that the Bible is true. And, and don't take my word for it. Go away and consider it yourselves. Ask your colleagues, ask your neighbours, your, your, your family perhaps, that perhaps maybe don't believe uh, the Bible. How can what we read in, in Zechariah 14 be, uh, be true if Zechariah had not been guided by God. So let's um, start reading there at verse 4. Zechariah 14, verse 4, talking about the return of the Lord Jesus, it says, And his, Jesus' feet, shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove north toward the north, and half of it toward the south. Now, often we find that those in our age today that might make pronouncements and prophecies, whether it's looking at a crystal ball or reading the, the stars or looking at, at cards, their predictions could sometimes be very vague, can't they? Yeah, that's not what we have here from Scripture. It's saying the Mount of Olives, a specific location that we know where it is today, will split in half that it will uh, split uh, east to west horizontally and half of it goes to the north and half of it goes to the south. Now, if the Bible's not true and Zechariah was just having a guess, then surely we can quite easily prove this is not going to be the case. It's not true. Now, that portion of scripture we've just read uh, was, was prophesied, was, was given by Zechariah between 520 and 490 B.C. Now, even the most ardent critics of Scripture could say, well, how do you know that, Mark? How do you know that this passage was written about 500 BC? What we can say is, well, we absolutely know, we turn to the front page of our Bible, I'm using a King James Version here, that the, the translation, this version, version that I'm reading from, came about in English in 1611. So we know for a fact that those words have been written in English since 1611, okay, that the earthquake had been predicted. Well, since 1611, or certainly since, uh, since 500 BC, our scientific community, uh, the scientists around the world, have, have understood this idea of plate tectonics. And you can't see it on the screen, but that is a, a, a screen grab from Wikipedia that talks about this, this idea that the Earth's crust is, is, is um, divided into plates, uh, and those plates sometimes move against each other or pull apart or push together. And at those points, those boundaries of tectonic plates, you have volcanic um, uh, activity and you have earthquakes. And the bit again I've highlighted there 
it says that this idea, this, this establishment of this idea uh, took place in the 1950s and was confirmed in the 1960s. So 70 years ago, recent scientific established fact. So the million dollar question, does what the Bible say, does this, this, this position of an earthquake, the cleaving of the Mount of Olives, align with the uh, plate boundaries as scientists have understood plate tectonics? Well, they do. A boundary of two plates runs up through the, city, through the country of, of, of Israel. And if I go into a slightly more detailed map there, you can see that on the right, that is the Mount of Olives uh, in the east. And the earthquake, despite the general fault line going north to south, there's an offshoot of that vertical fault line, as we see it on a map, that goes horizontally through the Mount of Olives. Now, now these aren't Christadelphian maps. They're not biblical. They're not religious maps. These are maps that have been established by those that, that look into the geology of the earth and have mapped out the boundaries of these plates. And if maps weren't enough of an evidence that there could be an earthquake under the Mount of Olives, um, just over 20 years ago, on the Mount of Olives, um, a business came together and said, we want to build a great, a grand hotel at the top of the Mount of Olives, overlooks the city of Jerusalem. Uh, and they were going to call it the Seven Arches. And you see their picture of it. And, 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 and they took their excavators up to the top of the Mount of Olives and they dug down and started breaking down through the rock to, to, to put the foundations in place. And they said, stop. This area is so sensitive to seismic movement. If you, if you disturb it, you could cause an earthquake. And so they had to relocate this grand hotel to uh, many miles further south onto more stable ground. So I put to you the same question again. How could this uh, man, Zachariah, make this pronouncement, make this prophecy that there's going to be an earthquake under this mountain in the, in, in the country of Israel before he knew anything about plate tectonics, he didn't have X-ray glasses. He didn't have a, a, a seismometer. He didn't, he didn't know that there was volcanic and, and, and earth crust movements in that location. How could he do it? Unless he was given that knowledge by a greater power who knew the Lord God. So hopefully I've given you some things to consider and perhaps to, to share with others around you about why we can truly believe that the Bible is God's given word. There, there's no ifs and buts. There's no vague uh, sort of cloud of doubt. We've been able to show that the Bible says things that the writers could not know anything about. And since then, we have found them to be absolutely true. In conclusion, then, we've looked at the planets. We've considered the details of the Earth, its shape, how it's suspended in space and looked at how the Big Bang doesn't follow the laws of science that every scientist recognizes and upholds today. We considered Egypt, how it was mighty and advanced in its day, but became abased, and although it's still a nation now, it's not a leading civilization in our world. And finally, we've just considered fault lines, how Zechariah prophesied around 500 BC, or, or certainly was in uh, the English language at 1611, and yet fault lines weren't discovered and understood since the 1960s. And that shows us the accuracy of uh, the scriptural record, that what it predicts and talks about aren't vague things that could be taken many different ways, but are very specific and have all come true. Well, the next most obvious question, perhaps, well, why is it important? Why should I care? Yes, you've, you've proved to me, Mark, the Bible seems to say things that are accurate, and yeah, I see it's important. Because the Bible, particularly in the New Testament, goes on to describe a sequence of events. That is, if we considered everything else it has prophesied has, has come to pass, and these things too must, uh, by a power of logic, also come to pass. 
This sequence of the Lord Jesus Christ returning to the earth. Of a judgment taking place. Of the giving of life to the faithful. The earth being renewed. That's the prophet Isaiah. We've already considered some of the things that Isaiah said and seen that they came true. And in Revelation, the joys of the kingdom. So to save you turning up, I've put them all on the screen, one after the other. So scripture tells us about Christ returning. Acts chapter 1, verse 11, which also said his disciples, uh, the, the angels, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner. The Bible prophesies that the Christ will return. Why would we try and disbelieve that? Why would we discount what it says now? Because a judgment will take place. Uh, Matthew 24, but as in the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Or as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. When Jesus returns, that's what it will be like. There will be a judgment. Men and women will be held accountable for what they have or have not done. Matthew goes on in verse 25, in chapter 25. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, this is the Lord Jesus Christ, he's come back to earth, he's, um, he's, he's judging them. Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. There will be those that are, are given great reward for their faithfulness in this life because they read the Bible and they believed it and lived by it. And then Isaiah describes the wonderful um, situation, uh, the environment in that kingdom, those that have been judged faithful. The wolf shall also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. Verse 9, they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Are there any bits of the sea that aren't covered by water? Of course not. The whole earth will be brought to a, a joyful crescendo in this kingdom. When we think of all the, the wickedness and pain and sorrow that's in the world with us today, God says it will not be like that in his kingdom. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall be any more pain for the former things are passed away. And he said unto me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. My dear brothers and sisters and, and friends and young people, the Bible has told us things that will come to pass and we have seen that some of those have certainly come to pass. We have seen the Bible describe natural um, circumstances on our earth and in the cosmos and to be approved to be absolutely accurate and correct. So what grounds have we got for not believing these five, and there's many more of them, but these five passages that we've just considered, showing that Christ will return and set up a kingdom on this earth? Well, what is left for us to do then? We're going back to our introductory reading of Mark 13. We are told to watch, therefore, for you know not when the master of the house cometh at even or at midnight or at the cock crowing for in, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. Well, what have we got to watch for? We've got to recognize that God has a plan with this earth and its people, that he tells us of that plan in his Bible, in his recorded word that has been preserved by him throughout the ages of, of words written down so that we might have a light in our lives. We might have a, a constant source of instruction in this ever-changing world of, of fashions and fads, that when Christ returns, as we now know he must have it's been prophesied about, that he might find us a people ready and, and waiting, an, uh, anticipating that return, that through his grace and mercy we may find a place in that kingdom to share in that glory. 